what's this about editing? I'm just going to flick back uh, briefly to the previous topic because it does relate, and that's to talk about the endings because yes. often they're related. So um, one of the films that I actually teach is called Road to Perdition, and um, it opens with a shot, quite kind of a moody shot of a boy with his back to camera, which is not a traditional opening. Normally you want to have somebody facing the screen or you want something action-wise that's actually going to grab the viewer rather than this, you know, back view. Um, the movie opens like that and the movie almost ends like that. It, it, it's a voiceover and then the voiceover continues as you see where the character finally ends up. But they are two identical shots and they are edited in such a way that we recognize that they are kind of bookends. So we've got, this is where the film starts and this is where the film ends. And then we actually realize that what we've been watching as a chronological story is actually one giant flashback. And really the story starts at the end and um, and he's just flashing back over the previous eight weeks and then telling us how he arrived at this point where he's standing looking at the lake. Um, but to move on to editing um, per se, one of the things that you're very often unaware of is the way in which the director is, is manipulating how you're responding to it. So, for instance, I was talking about the quantum of solace opening. Now, that's got a lot of cuts, multiple cuts. The more cuts you have, the more energy you get injected into a film. And so the director can get a certain room going. You can have a lot of cuts fast, you can have slow cuts, and then you have a sort of a slower, more moderate, more somber kind of pace. Um, you can have different takes, lengths of takes. So you can have obviously a long take or you can have a number of short takes. One of my favorite long takes um, actually happened by accident. It's in the movie called A Knight's Tale with Heath Ledger. And uh, a lot of people are quite scathing of the film, but I like it anyway. It's, it's anachronistic, but it's fun. Um, and there's a, there's a scene shot in a cathedral where it's almost entirely long shot, extreme long shot. And so you have, although they're talking about um, a jousting tournament, you have the sense of um, these characters talking about something bigger than themselves because you've got the majesty and the grandeur of the um, stained glass windows behind them and this filtered light. And so the camera tracks uh, as the character enters and then follows them walking together and then follows them walking back again. And the take goes on for about three minutes. And it gives this sense of very similitude, the sense of this is, you are really there. This is really them having this very intense discussion. Well, I'm uh, particularly interested in this editing process that goes on in movies. Um, yes. I'm well used to the editing process as Lorinda is when we're dealing with the written word. Um, yes. Uh, and and you will be as well. Uh, but it does seem to me that the written word can lead on to uh, thinking visually, thinking in terms of images, and how one is going to edit with image. And then, of course, that's got to lead on uh, 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 beyond, beyond all the, the photographs in the food book, all the images, in movie making, that's then got to lead on to uh, how do you edit with music? Um, how do you edit with silence? <laughs> uh, mm. so, so this editing process within the movie making genre seems to me to draw on a, a number of quite disparate sorts of talents. But mm. I'm going to hazard a guess here. Between the three of us, I'd like your opinion, first of all, Lorinda, um, and then Elise. Do you think that it's more natural to begin an editing process with words uh, and then move to these other things? 
Um, for myself, the, the recipes were fairly, uh, well, I, I researched them pretty well. So uh, while I was making um, the recipes, sometimes I would make three at the same time with slightly different ingredients if I was unsure about the outcome, especially with baking. Um, but um, And then I would just do minor um, editing with the recipe itself, the written word, and then afterwards, as I would then typeset it as well. But then for me, the photographs really spoke to me, and that was the, the major creativity that went into there. So I would um, take a number of shots, um, even with just with an empty bowl, just to test the light, that sort of thing. I, I didn't have any professional equipment, I might just add. It was quite a small camera, so nothing of the lights or, or anything to see here. So I had to be pretty careful about what the outcome is going to be. And yes, certainly to speak about composition again, I would take from certain uh, different angles. Um, because if you photograph food just from the front or just long, that's quite different. How are you going to sit and also to create interest that not two photographs after one another would be exactly the same. So it would be the same, say, 20 or 30 recipes later, but not page after page exactly the same but the editing afterwards um, was quite a bit so I would then look at the 30 or 40 photographs I've taken of that one particular dish and then see how I'm going to edit it am I going to crop it even more or the light um, I would uh, again with certain baking dishes and biscuits um, then see is the light appropriate is it not too cold for instance I like a warm light especially for food um, and again, is it not too shiny? Um, does it look um, artificial? Does it look like something I would like to eat straight away? And then um, also with sauces, that sort of thing, it can easily run uh, hot sauces. So often I would uh, make up a dish that is actually ice cold, just so that you don't get the steam build up when you take close shots, that sort of thing. So the editing would take quite a few hours afterwards. And it's very important, as Elise says, uh, to get your outcome. Yeah. How, how do you feel about that, Elise? Uh, do you see things springing, first of all, from editing of the the word through the image and then the other things? Or is there a different process that you think goes on uh, within the film world? Um, I think that the film world might actually be somewhat different. I think that the one of the constraints of the film world is the length of the movie, the, the amount of time that they have to operate within, you know. I think perhaps um, there's a little more flexibility as far as books are concerned. If you want to make this an A to Z kind of book, you can produce a really large comprehensive book or you can produce a slim volume focusing just on you know, fruity muffins or whatever your particular category might be. Your film has to tell the story, but it has to tell it within generally sort of 90 minutes to two hours. That's kind of the length of time that you, you know, you're allowed. Some, um, some directors have, have um, railed against that. And so you've had um, them splitting, you know, like The Hobbit, for instance. So they actually then will split the film into two segments um, and the Kill Bills are like that as well. So they, they're two really super length films. Um, but most most of the time, the director's got, you know, two hours that people would sort of um, budget towards watching a film. So they've got to get the story told within that time. They've, they've got to keep people interested, people of all sorts of attention spans, because unlike a book, you're kind of more trapped with a film. Um, you know, the book is something that you can pick up and put down and it's almost accepted and acknowledged that you will do that with a book. Whereas a film tends to be an immersive experience that you commit to, to start and to continue watching for the length on, and the duration of the film. Um, so, so is there a difference between uh, the film industry here and say the television industry where if you took, say, a, a movie like War and Peace, in TV terms, you can take this huge novel and chop it up into 12 or 14 episodes, which you, you wouldn't have a show of doing in a movie. Mm. 
I, I, I lost your, your sound slightly there, so I hope I'm answering correctly. But I think you were talking about, is there a little bit more flexibility with a mini series compared to a film? Is yeah. that right? Yes. Um, yes, I think I think there definitely is, and I think um, if you t if you compare something like Pride and Prejudice, for instance, that was the mini series compared to Pride and Prejudice, the film, you are allowed to have a lot more development of the minor characters, for instance, in the mini series, and there's a sense of um, of the maid, you know, a fleshing out of the major characters in the way that they interact with the minor characters that you don't get in the film because the film's just got to focus on the essential plot line and the essential essential uh, protagonists. Um, well, which is your favourite, Elise? Do you prefer the, the mini-series on television or do you prefer them going to the movies and watching the movie? Or is that not a, a real question? Um... <laughs> I yeah, I think they do different things. It's probably a little bit like saying, what's your favorite, eating the main course or eating dessert? You know, I, I, I want them both. <laughs> <laughs> Give them to me, Lorinda. <laughs> um, I think the other thing that um, is, is, is also a consideration, whether it's text or whether it's film, is how much you want to intrude in a sense um, in terms of the way that you edit make in, in how obvious is your editing so for instance you know in a film you can have there's always going to be transitions of some sort so you can have a transition that's fairly subtle something like a dissolve which is where um, your one one image gradually fades down to nothing and the other image sort of gradually fades up and so that's a very gentle editing process telling you we're moving from one scene to another or one time to another a little more intrusive is something um, called a fade which is doing the same thing but instead of going to another picture you fade to white or you fade to black and then you sort of fade up from that so that's a little more, you know, you notice it a little more consciously. And then if your director wants to really rub the editing transition in your face, they'll do something like a wipe, you know, like from left to right. The, the, the original picture sort of gets pushed out and the new picture gets pushed in. So it go, you know, it goes across like that. And then you kind of have this conscious sense of this is not real life I'm watching. Um, whereas the, the softer, gentler ones, tend to um, blur your sense of, of unreality. They, they tend to, um, you know, help you to sort of have this pretense of this is real. Lorinda, do you, uh, you're a movie buff, actually, uh, compared to me. <laughs> uh, do you get that sense of uh, when, you, uh, when you're drawn into a movie, do you, do you regard it as real life or do you regard it as a world in which you're being drawn into? How, how do you...? If it's done well, um, I certainly get drawn in as well. Um, I watch quite a few murder mysteries. I, I like that sort of thing. I like the mystery behind it. Um, and, this, and then they, the camera shots used there is then often, in a sense, to, to make you uh, as frightened as the victim is is being chased also um, as well. So you feel frightened as you sit on your couch as well. Um, or then the sense of the close-ups as well, um, I do identify with that. Or then um, also, um, as Elise said, with the, with the fading in and out, it would sometimes be right in the beginning with the introduction of characters when the plot is being set, when uh, one scene would go into another by just focusing, say, for instance, on the dull reflection of uh, an old-fashioned kettle, say, for instance, in one of the, the characters' homes. And from there, it just goes into the next scene with the next characters in a completely different area of the city or so. So that is sometimes done quite cleverly mm. to confuse the viewer as much in the beginning to confuse the whole plot. I think that is uh, done quite well sometimes. But yes, I do like to recognize themes that run through and often one wants to watch a movie twice to see which things one's actually missed in the beginning. Yeah. 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 Do you do that, Elise? Do you go back and watch again? 
and again i do i do yeah yeah it's, you know especially a movie that's intrigued me um and once you once you've got the general sense of the film then you're starting to pick up some of the small details so for instance baz lerman's romeo and juliet one of the transitions that i thought was absolutely stunning was romeo um, the first time that he meets juliet um he's supposedly taken some drugs and he's a bit out of it and he puts his face into a basin of water and then there's a close-up on his open eye and you see this iris and the next thing there's um the same iris shape but it's being formed out of fireworks and these are the fireworks that are happening at this party and um you know it just jumps from um you know where you are in this close-up with this character to to give you the sense of perhaps what's going on inside his brain as well as all of the razzmatazz of the party lifestyle that these people lived the other yeah i thought it's really quite interesting analysis i'm i'm going to make mention of a movie that um Stuart McAdam uh, and Matthew Morks, I think, um, twisted my arm that I had to I had to watch Noah with Russell oh, Crowe, and yeah. uh, I I finally watched it yesterday in preparation for tonight. Yes. And the fascinating thing about this movie was that well, it, it didn't draw me in at all. No. Um, no. But. The opening sequence wasn't about Noah at all. It was telling the story of the snake in the Garden of Eden. And they chose uh, a highly stylized cartoon-like snake. And I thought, the miserable so-and-sos have stolen that from my book, Adam and Eve and Evolution, <laughs> where we had a similar snake crawling through the... <clears throat> There was how a movie, in my opinion, failed to deliver because it couldn't, at the opening sequence, get its genres right. So it relied on a kind yeah. of a cartoon-like thing. Then it moves through a whole lot of... Uh, don't get me wrong, I mean, they drew on the Book of Enoch and um, the story of the giants from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, little fragments, I think, exist. I don't think the whole book exists plus the biblical account. But here's an example of something that potentially could have been fantastic, but actually, well, it didn't convince me. So having watched it, I then went back and read all the reviews. And just mm. about every reviewer raved over the form, you know, biblical, epic oh, really? proportion. <laughs> and I thought, I'm missing something. But the longer I thought about it, the more I realized that what was going on was that I was not being drawn into either mm. a biblical story or a biblical retelling of a story. Mm. I was being drawn into a little bit of modern movie making mythology. Yeah. And, and that's what they were aiming for. So uh, we, we get drawn in but we don't always um, necessarily get drawn in in the way that the director or the actors intend us to be.